I want to slide off here. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our closing event of this year's fall gathering, our 12th annual fall gathering of the Glacier Two Medicine Alliance, and our second virtual fall gathering, uh, following the one we had last year in 2020. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Again, my name is Peter Metcalf, and I'm the executive director of Glacier Two Medicine Alliance, and we're very excited to um, have Dan Carney with us this evening. We'll get to him in just a minute, um, as well as to have our final uh, countdown for this year's fundraising auction. But uh, we'll just wait a minute or two here to let people come in and join um, this evening before we get started. So again, as we've done every, other evenings, as you come in, if you want to throw your name in the chat, as well as maybe where you're joining us from, that'll be great. And then we'll get started here in just a minute. Again, as you're joining us this evening, go ahead and throw your name um, into the chat and where you're joining us from. It's great to see Jesse from, from Boise and Donna from down on Badger Creek. Really excited to spend this evening with you as we wrap up this year's uh, fall gathering. It's really been an amazing week. Um, started last Friday with uh, Dr. Christina Eisenberg and uh, sharing about uh, her research in the crown of the continent around predator-prey relationships and ecological systems and the use of uh, both traditional knowledge and Western science to help better understand these systems and the way we can restore kind of critical um, relationships, both ecological and cultural here in the Crown. And then of course, Saturday, we had our big event with uh, Governor Bullock. It was great to have uh, Steve join us and just really share an inspiring talk about the importance of the work of all of us as citizens in helping to um, build support for conservation, for public lands and wildlife uh, with our neighbors um, in our communities and through the political process. And um, then of course, if you were able to join us on Wednesday night, we had a fabulous presentation from Willow Kip, the Knee Initiative coordinator, uh, talking about the um, efforts that the Knee Initiative and the Blackfeet Buffalo program are leading uh, to restore uh, buffalo or you need to um, not just Blackfeet lands, but also surrounding public lands in the U.S. and Canada um, and the cultural restoration that comes with that. And then, of course, we saw a great film and had a nice conversation with Daniel Glick on Wednesday night about um, wolves. And this evening, um, we're going to turn to another very charismatic and sometimes controversial species, uh, grizzly bears, when we join Dan Carney here in just a minute. So it's been a fabulous week in terms of our, our speakers and our guests who've come together. If you missed any of that, um, Dr. Christina Eisenberg on Friday or uh, Governor Bullock on Saturday, uh, my State of the Badger, which I shared on Saturday night as well, or wanted to catch the music that Joey Running Crane provided as part of this year's gathering. All of those are currently up on our YouTube page. Um, and uh, Ashley will put a link into the chat here and it's also been out on uh, the emails. Uh, we hope to have uh, the conversation with Willow up um, as well soon, and we'll send a link when, when that's live too. Um, but again, if you're just joining us, thanks for being here tonight, whether it's your first night at the gathering or you've been with us every night over the past week. Um, it's been really exciting to see the enthusiastic response to this year's auction. Um, a lot of fabulous items out there. We can't thank all of our donors so much for making that possible. Um, both the individuals and the businesses who have provided these fabulous experiences, um, artwork, um, handicrafts, uh, lessons, uh, skiing and, and, and yoga and raft trips and lodging. Uh, make sure you check out the acknowledgement page to see all of the people. It really takes a whole community to make the work of Glacier Two Medicine Alliance happen. And we've been seeing that um, this week. So thank you to all of our donors and thank you to everyone who has been Bidding. It's been really fun to see the enthusiasm. And uh, as I announced on Saturday too, um, any donations that are brought in during this week, um, apart from the auction, will directly help Glacier Two Medicine Alliance hire a community outreach and engagement coordinator. We're very excited that we were selected for a very selective WIS fellowship to help hire an early career um, individual to work as a community outreach and engagement coordinator over the next two years on things related to Badger Two Medicine. Um, protection and stewardship. So uh, any donations this week will help support uh, uh, that position over the next two years. So thank you so much for 
for uh, considering that um, this evening. Well, I'd like to turn now to our guest of the evening, uh, Dan Carney, who many of you know and have met over the years, and he may be new to some of you as well. Um, Dan has been a longtime fixture in the grizzly bear conservation community and in the larger wildlife conservation community, as well as locally here um, on, the, on the Blackfeet uh, Reservation in East Glacier. For 31 years, um, Dan served uh, with Blackfeet Fish and uh, Wildlife and was the director of their Threatened and Endangered Species Program, where he had opportunities to work um, with grizzly bears and a number of other species uh, as well during that time. And Dan got his start with bears way back in 1978 when he volunteered on a program uh, at the University of Montana when he was an undergraduate with uh, Chuck Jonkel, the legendary, one of the legendary grizzly bear biologists here um, in Montana. And that led him to a long career, which he's gonna share us with us some of uh, those experiences and what he learned um, and insights into grizzly bears uh, this evening. So we're very excited to have Dan after his presentation, uh, as we have uh, other evenings this week, we'll have time for Q and A. So make sure that if you have questions for Dan, that you drop them in the Q and A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will try our best to get to those questions during our time for the chat afterwards. So, um, and with that, I'm really excited to welcome Dan Carney. Please put your hands together wherever you are for Dan, and uh, we'll turn it over to him this evening. Thank you, Peter. Um, so what I've got planned this evening, I've got some slides and um, photos to show you for about, and I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to um, questions. And let's see if, here we go. This worked great when we were practicing. <laughs> no worries. So Dan, I think that you're at the end of the show, so you just need to go back to the first slide. Okay. Ah. There we go. Word. I'll just from. So you could scroll up to the top, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, so, for, so for 40 or 45 minutes, just kick back and enjoy yourself um, like this fella is. And I'm going to talk about what I've been doing on the Blackfeet Reservation for the last 31 years, not for the last 31 years, I'm sorry, but from 1987 until 2018 when I retired. Um, the Blackfeet Reservation is part of the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, which goes from the Canada border down along the East Front. The Blackfeet Reservation is up in the upper right-hand part of this map. Um, the grizzly bear recovery line went down um, from Canada, just about through East Glacier, um, down to Hart Butte, down along the East Front to just west of Shoto, further south to Lincoln, and then up on the um, east side of Flathead Lake and to the back to the Canada border up past Eureka. It includes Glacier National Park and the Bob Marsh Wilderness. The Blackfeet Reservation, what the part of it that's in the recovery zone um, was about 6% or so of the recovery zone. In 1987, when we started this study, it was started, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs funded it to the Blackfeet tribe. Um, the reason was 
when they were doing oil and gas exploration and other resource extraction things, they had to do environmental assessments or environmental impact statements, and they didn't have the information that they needed to um, figure out how those were going to affect grizzly bears. So that's why the study was originally funded. Some pretty basic objectives at the beginning to determine habitat use by grizzly bears, um, find out uh, how much cross boundary movement there was from the reservation into the park or into the national forest or into Canada. None of that would, had been documented or was very well known. We wanted to determine mortality level and causes of mortality of grizzly bears. Um, other studies in the area, like um, from the East Front, um, radio collared grizzly bears that came on the reservation often just disappeared. And they didn't know if it was a, a mortality sink here or just what was going on. And we also wanted to document food habits. So during the course of the talk, what I want to do is, is emphasize changes that I've seen over those 31 years. And these are not necessarily changes that I've done statistical analyses on and and you know can show a significant difference, but just observations that I've made and how things are different now than they were then. Um, so to to meet those objectives, one of the things we had to do was um, trap grizzly bears, put radio collars on them, and follow them around. We used several kind of traps. Uh, the most Common is an Aldrich leg hold snare. A leg hold snare is a steel cable. Um, in this photo, it's down on the lower left. We would often start out with uh, making a V out of logs and putting the bait in the back. And then you put the snare right um, where you can guide that bear's foot into. Ideally, it's gonna throw the steel cable, which is a quarter inch cable, up around the bear's foot. The back of the snare is anchored to a tree and, and holds it there till we show up with the dart gun and, and go from there. Now, in that picture, that bear's wearing a radio collar. And often they learn pretty fast what to do to avoid that trap. They can spring it in one way or another or just go around it, tear in the back of the cubby, and grab the bait and walk off with it. Um, they'll often teach their cubs how to do the same sort of a thing. That's just what went on here. We also use culvert traps, which are big barrels with uh, bait in the back of those barrels. When they pull on that bait, the door slides down shut and holds them in there. Uh, some of these slides I threw in just for fun. Um, those culvert traps are about four feet high and eight feet long. A big bear like this um, might not get caught in a culvert trap too because he can walk in there a ways and reach up and grab the bait. And when the door comes down, it'll land on his butt. And um, that's what happened in this case. He backed out without ever getting caught in there. This is a very large bear compared to most of the ones we've handled. We use the culvert traps to move bears. Um, we have a thing that sits up on top of the culvert trap where we can hook a pulley to and a rope through that pulley and then down to the door so that we can raise the door remotely from 20 or 30 yards away. That way, if the bear comes out and he's upset and decides to take a run at you away, you've already got a head start. They didn't do that often, but often enough that I would not want to be standing on top of the trap and lifting the door that way. I always had a couple of tribal members as technicians that were working with me. Um, it varied over the 31 years, um, depending on what we were doing with different projects. I had up to oh, 16 or 17 people working on the uh, program for different things. 
at, um, at one time, but mostly uh, for the hands-on day-to-day stuff, it was only two or three technicians. When we got a bear, we would put a radio transmitter collar on it for the first big part of the study. Um, we tracked those bears from the ground and from air. Um, I, don't, I won't go into all the details of what we did for handling the bears and stuff, but, but we um, pulled a small tooth so that you could determine the age of the bear. We always, after the first half of the study or so, we were giving them oxygen and, and pretty well advanced our skills with different drugs and so on. So that um, we were always trying to give them the best care that we could. This is how we found them uh, the most accurate way, um, other than seeing them. Um, it was the unbiased way to do it. If you're trying to locate bears from the ground, as far as habitat use and, and preference, you're only going to get that sort of information for bears that are close enough to the road where you can find them. Um, from the plane though, it's a much um, better way to get habitat information. The habitat information we got for the first well, 10 or 12 years of the study, um, we probably averaged 50 or 60 radio locations on bears in a year. We tried to fly twice a week. And um, some of that time we would find them, some of the time we didn't. Um, when we overlaid those radio locations with different um, aspects on vegetation maps, we could come up with a map that showed um, habitat preferences. In this map, for instance, um, Two Medicine Lake is kind of in the bottom center of that map, but it, it shows that the orange is the highest quality habitat and it goes right down to the blue and the black, which is um, not used by bears much at all. This sort of information is great when you're planning things like um, oil and gas exploration or logging units or whatever. So when the bears come out in the spring, when they're in their dens when, um, through the winter, they come out um, from mid-March to mid-April. The females that have cubs, new cubs with them, usually come out last, and that's uh, mid to late April. Uh, the average den at that time, when I started doing the work, they were all denning up in the park or very high on the reservation. We only had a couple dens on the reservation. Most of them were up in the park at elevations from about 6,500 feet up to 7,500 feet and even some of them higher up uh, almost 8,000 feet. But they would den in these sort of um, subalpine fir, white bark pine habitats where they would dig under the root of a tree, sometimes out in the open, but, but mostly under the roots of a tree, uh, back in six feet or up to eight feet, um, then line that hole with bear grass or fir boughs and spend the winter there. It's just another photo to show how deep some of them were. Um, back at the end of that little tunnel, there was usually a chamber, depending on the size of the bear and how many bears there were in it, um, how big that chamber was. And then when they come out of the den, um, you, most of you probably are familiar with, with what bears feed on in the spring. They'll eat a lot of glacier lilies, dig the bulbs from glacier lilies, uh, eat grasses and forbs, uh, later on in the summer, they'll turn to whatever kind of berries are ripe, service berries, choke cherries. Um, some of the bears would go up higher and eat huckleberries. Uh, all times a year, you could find them digging vetch roots or um, bitter root 
that sort of thing. We also had a lot of bears go up in the high elevation eat and eating uh, army cutworm moths. Um, these army cutworm moths are high in talus slopes like this up in the park. Uh, this is a couple of places where they've been digging for the moths up there. Um, the first few years that I was doing the research, um, about half of the bears that we had radio collared, males and females, would go up into these high elevations and eat moths. Uh, some of them often would go up about the third week in June and sometimes stay up there depending on the year up until snow is uh, up there in September. I have flown over areas and seen bears down there digging in these moth sites in several inches of snow. Um, it's one of the things that has changed over time. Um, the last probably 10 years that I was doing research uh, here, I don't think any of the bears that I had radio collared then would go up into these moth sites. I'm not sure why that difference is. The bears still use these moth sites. There's a graduate student named Eric Peterson who is um, working on his degree and his research is studying these moth sites up there and he's finding a lot of bears using them now. Just not the bears that we've got collared on the reservation anymore. And this is just a, a couple of photos to show that these bears go up in these places and don't mind um, being up on the steep side hills on the mountainsides probably as much as I do. Um, They'll climb and crawl around all over the place. These bears aren't in moth sites. Um, I it's a late summer, or early fall photo. I think that they're probably up there digging uh, vetch roots. Another interesting thing um, that we found as far as food habits, um, every bear that we caught, we would take a hair sample from. We could send this hair sample into a, a researcher in Washington state who did an analysis and was um, trying to figure out in different areas how much animal matter was in the bear's diet. Um, he called me up one day and asked if all the hair samples I was sending him was from bears that were causing cattle depredations. And uh, I said, no, I'm sending you every, every bear that we've got. I'm sending a hair sample from, from the ones we catch no matter what they're eating or doing. And um, he was surprised at that because our, the hair samples that we were sending in were showing that the grizzly bears in this area had as high or higher concentration of animal matter in their diet than anywhere else in the ecosystem. Um, you can see in this map that um, the red that's over around browning on the right side of the map, that's the high concentration of, of animal matter in the diet. And through the park in the west part of the Bob Marshall Wilderness Way, it goes right down to about nothing. That's because of the livestock that's available around here. And not that bears go around killing a lot of livestock. They're just available because they can find them dead, um, especially in the spring and early summer when um, cows are calving, when the weather can turn. Uh, there are a lot of cows and calves that die. And Previously, ranchers would just haul them back behind the barn or off at the edge of the pasture or something like that, and uh, bears would come and feed on them. Now, one of the things that we did during this research, um, 
I'm a firm believer that research should tell you something useful that you can use for management implications. Some of the management implications were that we needed to do some management. Um, we would move these carcasses um, that were going to draw bears into conflict situations with ranchers or with uh, residents of, of any kind. Um, most people don't want bears drawn in around their ranches, especially if they're calving or into their pastures. So um, we would load them up onto a pickup truck with a winch that's on the back of the truck and haul them off somewhere where the bears could take advantage of this pretty important protein source and not be in an area where there was potential conflict with people. Whenever we would dump these at different sites, we would always put up signs warning people so that they didn't, they weren't out hiking and just bumble into them or something. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk a little bit about livestock depredations. Um, we took over from the animal damage control at the time, now they're wildlife services, but we took over the work that they were doing to investigate uh, livestock depredations and um, that way we could get the ranchers paid. At the beginning of the work, the um, Great Bear Foundation actually was paying for livestock depredations. And after a few years, Defenders of Wildlife took over that program. They did a great job at it for a long time. And for the past few years, the state has uh, been paying ranchers for their depredations. But I, I want to show you some photos, how we can tell that a grizzly bear killed a cow um, versus, versus, versus some of the other predators. And, and a warning here, some of these photos are very bloody. Um, if you get upset about that sort of thing, you might want to go get a drink of water or take five here. Um, but often, when we were called about this sort of a thing or about a dead cow, there would be bears feeding on it. Um, not very many bears kill livestock. I'm sure it's less than 10% of the bears out there actually kill livestock. Um, but a lot of them find livestock that's dead and they'll take advantage of that and eat it. Now our job, the trick, was to determine which ones had been killed by bears and which ones had just been found by bears and fed on. I, I've looked at everything from just a couple of bones that were left. Usually you can't tell a thing about that, but some cows were completely intact without a scratch on them and ranchers would think that a bear killed them. But this is often a, a typical thing when you look at, um, you can't really tell from that what happened to that. So we would skin them. And when you skin them, that tells a whole nother story. When a grizzly bear kills something like a cow or a calf, almost every time they'll grab them across the spine on the top of the shoulders or right behind the shoulders. And it's a lot of trauma there. The hemorrhaging and the bite marks that go clear through the hide cause a lot of damage and bruising. It's fairly obvious. Uh, they also often bite right across the head. Um, just being, just the bite there is not necessarily an indicator of it being killed because if a bear finds a cow somewhere or a calf, they'll often grab them by the face and, and drag them off that way. Um, but all this hemorrhage and the bloodshot and the crushed bones uh, indicates that that was indeed a, a kill. If the bear just found it, that wouldn't be all red and bloodshot like that. Compared to that, wolves um, will run alongside something and jump up and be biting at them, biting along their shoulders. Um, again, the, you'll see the hemorrhaging and the bloodshot when an animal has been grabbed or, or bitten when it's still alive. They'll often hamstring them and be biting them 
uh, on, on the hind legs as well. <clears throat> Mostly the most common time that I saw wolves attacking livestock was late in the summer when they were teaching their pups how to hunt. Other animals, coyotes, um, had much smaller teeth marks. Uh, they didn't cause as much damage, but there was bruising through the hide like that when they were still alive. Um, coyotes never attacked anything much smaller than a, a very young calf. Uh, they'll also go after sheep. Mountain lions, I don't have any photos of a mountain lion kill, but they almost always would grab something up under the throat. Um, and their, their target is fairly specific too. Um, mostly grizzly bears would go after cows and calves. Uh, everything goes after sheep, but um, grizzly bears would go after cows and calves. And I think in the 31 years that I've worked here, I probably saw four or five horses or colts that were killed by grizzly bears. Mountain lions, on the other hand, um, I don't think I ever saw a colt or, I mean, a, uh, a calf or a cow that was attacked by a mountain lion. They almost always went after horses and colts and sheep as well. Like I said, everything goes after sheep. Often when we got called to these sorts of things, there was nothing left. A bear could you know, several bears could clean up a carcass pretty quick. Um, depending on what was left, if there was just a, some balled up old dry hide, sometimes we could soak that in a barrel of water, stretch it out, and if the teeth marks and puncture wounds were in the right spot across the spine, um, and a, often even an old dried up thing, when you uh, put it in water and soak it, you could still see some sign of hemorrhaging around those teeth marks, then um, I could fill out the paperwork and get the rancher paid for it. If, uh, if not, otherwise, I'm, if, if I was pretty sure that that was what happened, I would tend to give the benefit of the doubt to the rancher, but, um, but also, even if the rancher wants to argue a lot and cows, they'll find a, a lot of different ways to die. Um, I've done necropsies on cows and calves and some of them will eat huge bones or uh, wire or anything um, and end up dying from all sorts of things other than predators. Another thing that we dealt with a lot was garbage. Um, over the course of the time that I worked here, we, I, oh gosh, I got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of grants for one thing and another to try and deal with garbage. It's always a tricky situation. Um, we've tried different things, dumpsters like these that, um, didn't work very well for several reasons. We were always limited and, and we had to have equipment that was compatible with the solid waste department's trucks. Um, but we also had to find something that was user friendly. Uh, stuff like these large dumpsters, people would crank up the lids, throw the garbage in and never crank the lids back down. And sometimes it got to be just a mess. Um, this is the site up around Bab where the solid waste folks didn't empty it very often and it just got to be a community dump site. Uh, bears would feed there on a regular basis, several bears every evening. And um, you can't tell very well in this, but there's houses in the background there. That's um, right around Bab. Always a bad situation. We all heard the, the saying of fed bear is a dead bear, and that's not far from the truth. This case, um, what would happen is 
when the solid waste folks would show up and dump it then, the bears that were eating in this area on a regular basis would still climb up there and climb into the dumpster to get a little bit of the garbage left, but now they couldn't climb out. Um, we drugged several bears that were actually caught inside the dumpsters and not able to get out. And then we would uh, relocate them. Now you've probably all seen these around East Glacier and uh, other areas along the front. They're probably the most successful thing we've tried so far. Um, that individual households have these. They're pretty successful. We have had some grizzlies learn how to chew through the hinges on the back of the lid or actually chew right through the sides in some cases and get the garbage out. Um, I think a lot of those are bears that have already been food conditioned to garbage. And, but for the most part, they're, they're pretty successful at keeping the bears out as long as people can latch the lids. In the mid 2000s, about 2003, 2004, we cooperated with the US Geological Survey Kate Kendall started a project to find out how many bears there were in the ecosystem. We worked along with the Forest Service and Fish, Wildlife and Parks and several other agencies to try and figure out how many bears there were. The way we did that was we would put a lure out. This lure was made of uh, blood and melted down fish that would uh, put out a pretty strong smell. It didn't provide a food reward to the bears. They couldn't actually eat anything. It was just a pretty strong smell. Um, we wrapped barbed wire around trees like this so that when they came to that lure, they would uh, lose a few hairs on that barbed wire. We could do the DNA analysis on uh, those hairs and identify individual grizzly bears. That study indicated that there were 765 grizzly bears. That was the, the middle of the range of an estimate um, in the ecosystem. That was in 2004. Um, since uh, another way we collected hair samples was bears that would rub on rub trees. Um, bears often find this particular one's a power pole, but they would rub on trees along the trails in different places. Uh, it's probably a territory marking behavior. But um, once we located those trees, we could um, go back and check and get the hairs off of them and identify individuals that way too. Put all that information into a mark recapture sort of a program. And that's how we got that 765. Now, since then, we've been cooperating and, and working on a um, population trend monitoring thing. This population study that came up with the 765 bears in the ecosystem was very work and in, labor intensive. There were hundreds of people working on that project for a couple of years and it cost several million dollars to do that. Obviously that's not the kind of thing you can do on a regular basis. So the population trend monitoring thing is a smaller scale thing. Um, the idea is to trap females and put um, radio collars on them and follow them around. If you've got enough of information about these females, you learn things like how old they are when they first have cubs, how often they have cubs, how many cubs they have, how old they are when they don't have cubs anymore, um, and the survival rate of those cubs. When you put all that sort of information into another population model, it'll tell you whether the population is increasing, stable, or decreasing. Um, the information that we found shows that up until now, the population has been increasing between two and 3% per year. So 
you add that two and three percent per year onto um, the 765 bears from 2004, and you end up with well, there's over a thousand bears in the ecosystem when I retired, probably over 1,100 now. Um, I took a little different spin to that by now, by the 2010 and later, why there are getting to be quite a few bears in the ecosystem, more than any of us suspected actually. But um, rather than just set traps to put more radio collars on, uh, when you set a trap out like a culvert trap or, or a um, snare, you end up catching a lot of black bears, you catch males, um, you catch non-target animals basically. And, and rather than subject a lot of animals like that to stress that they don't need and cost for us, um, we tried something a little different. So we would put trail cameras up at bait sites and we saw a guy like this, that's obviously an adult male, um, well, fairly obviously, anyway, we wouldn't do anything. When we saw something more like this, obviously you can tell that this is the female. We sometimes went by the size of the bear, but um, the best thing to determine whether it was a female or not was if she had, whether she had cubs with her. This is an, another thing of the trail cam showed that um, we had a female with cubs there and, and uh, a bear that we wanted to target to put a radio collar on. We'd put up a tree stand. This isn't me in a tree stand. This is a, a buddy of mine, the recovery coordinator at the time actually. And um, I would get up in the tree stand with a dart gun the dart gun was specially set up. It had a fishing reel on the end of it. I would take the line from the fishing reel, put it back through the barrel of the gun, tie it on the needle of the dart. And then when I shot the bear um, with the dart, the bear would take off and we could follow the fishing line right to the bear. Most often bears would run about a hundred yards. Um, not many of them would run much farther than that, but um, in the evenings is when they would usually come to these baits. So um, we would, it would be a whole lot faster anyway to, to just follow that string. It worked out very well. Um, this particular time I'm in that tree that the bears are looking up at, that the one on the right is looking up at. This is that mother that was in that picture just before that. She just kept on eating. I think when the dart hit her, she probably figured that one of her cubs snapped at her or something. She turned around and whacked a cub with a paw and then um, ate a little bit more and laid down right there and went to sleep. Once they did that, I would call on the radio to my buddies in the truck. They would come and put the ladder up to get me out of the tree. And then we would go ahead and work on that bear just like um, we would if she had been in a snare. Um, put her on a tarp and, and weigh her and, and things like that. Uh, in a case like this, the young would always just run off somewhere and, and usually be in the background. We could hear them or see them moving around 50 or 60 yards away usually. Then later on, um, we get the data from the plane when we're flying to see how many cubs are still with the female, you know, checking the survival rates and things like that. The, um, as the number of bears increased, so did the range of bears. Um, when I first started working, most of the bears were within that recovery zone boundary. There were some that were outside of it, but not very many. Um, and now, uh, this slide is actually out of date to now, but when I retired three years ago, this is where bears roamed. They were way out east of Browning, way out on the prairie. Just another indication of a change. 
when I first started working and, and trapping bears in 1988, we were trying to catch every bear that we could get our hands on for this study to, to get it rolling off its feet. We caught one bear in the fall of 87. That's when I actually started in September of 87. In 1988, um, we trapped hard all summer. We had between 12 and 20 traps set at different sites from Highway 2 north to the border. And um, we're doing everything we could to catch all the grizzlies we could. We caught five grizzly bears. <clears throat> I could, I could catch five grizzly bears next week, um, given hardly a very small part of the effort that we put in that whole summer anyway. That's just a, one of those little things to me that shows how many more bears there are then, or now than there were then. And, and um, I had been trapping bears for 10 years then, so it wasn't like I was brand new and didn't know what I was doing. And, and we were using the game wardens and other people that worked for me that really knew the area. So it's not like we were just walking around blind trying to find the bears. I'm not sure if maybe there was some other reason that more of them stayed up in the park, something like that. So another big change that we've had um, is the um, radio transmitters that we use. It's like I said, when um, we first started, we put a collar on a bear and if we were lucky, we'd get 50 or 60 radio locations a year out of that bear. Uh, the new GPS collars are incredibly accurate. They'll get a radio location down to a meter or two and you can program them to get as many radio locations as you want. It's all dependent on the battery life that you want. It's a trade-off, but um, if you put a collar on a bear that you want to stay on that bear for three years, you can still get four radio locations a day from that um, GPS collar. It uses the same technology as a GPS in your car or something to locate exactly where it is and, and record that. These are three different bear locations or three different bears um, with their locations. And you can sort of see the um, center of activity of, of each of these different bears. But there's so many locations at this range that they overlap so much you can hardly tell. Um, there are dozens of locations on top of each other in there. This, uh, is an area some of you are probably pretty familiar with. It's the South Fork of Two Medicine. We've had several bears radio collared in there. This is two of them. Um, in the early 2000s there, or in the mid 2000s, there was another push on the reservation for oil and gas exploration. Um, the information came in pretty handy for some of that. Um, with these new collars, we actually had information right around where some of the wells were drilled. This is a, a well pad that's kind of to the right of the center of the um, photo there. And one bear had you know, been using the habitat very close to where that well pad was. With that information and the way more radio locations, we were able to um, develop new habitat preference models, not just for up in the mountains, but for out in the prairie. Um, you could see by that one map that there are more and more bears uh, ranging out further to the east. But our new habitat model, rather than just being in the recovery zone, goes clear out to the east end of the reservation, which is fitting because so do the bears. Now, one of the things when I started working was um, that I used to always wonder, um, well, when those bears are out there, some of them are taking advantage of uh, the grain that's out there, wheat fields and different sorts of grain. 
um, they still tend to hang out during the day or, or travel along little riparian creeks and corridors. Uh, I'm sure eating a lot of grass and uh, the damp stuff along then, the creeks. But I've always wondered, so when Lewis and Clark came here and they found grizzly bears in North Dakota, where did those bears den? For years, all of our bears that were collared were denning up in the park at the higher elevations. And I wondered, what are those bears that were clear out there on the Missouri River? Did they come back and den in the mountains? Well, we're learning that they probably didn't because a lot of the bears more and more now are denning out on the prairie. This is a typical den out on the prairie. Um, they'll still find the side of a hill somewhere, but down at much lower elevations, um, 4,500 feet and, and right down lower than that even. But this is a typical prairie den. Um, again, they'll find areas where there's some shrubs. I think those roots from the shrubs support the roof of the uh, den so it doesn't collapse. Most of these dens that I found out on the prairies did collapse after a year or two. But um, this was a family group den of female with a couple of uh, cubs spent the whole winter out here. But the areas where um, mostly there were some shrubs and that's where um, snow had uh, drifted over. And I think that's why the shrubs were there, but that's also why the bears picked those areas to den. This one, on the other hand, didn't have any um, shrubs around it. <clears throat> but uh, you can see that den right there is in the center of this photo. And it's a good 30 miles from the mountain. Um, it's east of Highway 89, uh, Highway 89 south of Browning. And we've had bears even further, den even further out than, than that. There's another picture of a den that's out on the prairie. Instead of bear grass and uh, fir boughs, they just pick the shrubs and whatever's around there to use for bedding. This bear pulled a lot of it out of her den and found some other stuff and made a nice nest in the spring that she just laid on that a while beside her den. She had, she came out of this den with cubs as well. This is a den that's right above the, that's the Two Medicine River in the background. I think this is actually east of the road between Cutbank and Valier. So as the bear population moves further east, as the uh, range expands, one of the needs that I saw was for our conflict prevention work to move further east as well. Um, it's a never ending sort of a thing that the bears out there are now facing the same sort of issues and problems that we worked on 30 years ago up along the mountain front, like in places like East Glacier and Kiowa and St. Mary. Um, there's still folks out there that are not used to having bears around and they are, you know, got dog food on the porch and the garbage can in the garage and um, the sort of things that attract bears and uh, we end up with calls about conflicts. So the conflict prevention stuff that we did, I had several grants for that and we, we did a lot of proactive work on that, well, actually a lot of it was reactive, but um, things like putting up electric fences around uh, beehives, around other things that attracted bears in, sometimes around um, grain bins. Um, we had a, a deal where we were, we bought uh, bear spray for pretty reasonable price and uh, actually sold it to people for $5 a can. Anybody that was recreating on the reservation 
I think that was pretty important in reducing the amount of mortalities that we had on the bear. Since then, um, since I retired, um, I'm not real sure what's going on. All the stuff that I've told you about, if I expressed any opinion or anything like that, it was not necessarily the opinion of the tribe or the Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife Department. The personnel has changed there now. Um, I know that they're still doing some pretty good work. Uh, I know, well, as, as of last spring anyway, I know the guys that were doing the work on bears. And, um, but the data or positions, anything like that, that I've talked about, um, doesn't hold for the new tribal business council. I don't know what their views are or, or uh, if they've made changes to the regulations and laws or not. Uh, it's the same sort of thing with the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. They've made some huge changes. Now I'm not familiar with all of them. And um, even the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as their personnel, the um, policies change in different agencies. And um, I'm not necessarily up to snuff on what's going on with them now. But I was lucky enough to um, work with a lot of great people in um, one of the most beautiful places around and on an animal that's as magnificent as, as any that I can imagine to work with. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to do that. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Awesome, Dan, thank you so much for that really uh, terrific um, presentation. And it was just fascinating to both see some of the range of the work that you did over your time um, there at the, as the head of the um, Threatened and Endangered Species Program, as well as just some of the changes that you observed um, on the land uh, during that time. We've got a lot of questions coming in, I see here, and um, I'm gonna get us started in a moment. And so folks, just as a reminder, if you have questions, please make sure you drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those over the next few minutes here with Dan. Um, and one of the things I'd like to just, you know, your talk reminded me of those wonderful pictures of seeing those dens out by the Two Medicine. And this summer, I had the privilege to go on the Lewis and Clark history tour that Larry Epstein is, is offering tonight and that we've seen some hot bidding on it. It's just a, it was a really fabulous tour. And not to take anything away from Larry, but on our way home, um, just south of Browning along Highway 89, we observed what for me and many in our party was the first grizzly bear that I'd seen out on the plains. Just Roman, just south of the, the old Smith Ranch, now the Buffalo Spirit Hills Ranch where some of the uh, Elk Island herd that, it, that Willow told us about were, were housed. And it was an amazing just view. You could see Black Angus in the background, bison kind of the side and this grizzly bear roaming around. And it was like the past and future of the West and wildlife conservation, all just kind of mixed in right there. And I, you know, so it was cool to hear your story about what you observed as bears were moving east. And I was just wondering to kick us off here. Um, over time, did you see any changes in bear diets as they move further east? Did that, that, that percentage of meat in their diet continue to hold up or do you have any data to show that um, as bears move out on the plains that we see them eating more animal or non-animal foodstuffs than maybe in those early early years that you observed? Well, the, the guy that was doing that work where we sent the hair samples to, um, I don't think that he's still doing the same stuff. We have not been sending hair samples to him the last few years anyway. I suspect that bears out there that far east still have access to probably as much um, livestock carcasses as they want. But I also suspect they, some of them anyway, are more concentrated on grain and um, other agricultural products. Um, we would always, uh, this time of year, 
um, around grain bins or, or silos, um, often find scats where bears had uh, taken advantage of the grain that had spilled out alongside the silos while the farmers were loading it and stuff. Um, so I, I know that some of them, I don't know. I guess the bottom line is whether they're eating as much meat. I don't think they have to. Um, the biggest female that I ever handled was uh, pretty far out on a prairie and she weighed 580 something pounds, which for a female is, uh, well, like I say, it was by far the biggest one that I've handled. And um, I think she was making a pretty good living, mostly eating grain. And mostly like spilled grain, or were they actually like forage it out of the, the fields where it was still on the, on the shaft? The, both. Okay. They'll, um, they'll find it when it's concentrated, but they'll be out there wandering around in the wheat fields too. Yeah. Okay. And what are some of the uh, dominant uh, non-agricultural food sources for grizzly bears on the plains? Do they have a similar source of access to roots and, and yeah. um, products yeah, like different. you talked about in the mountains, or is it a different kind of suite of products? Different, uh, different vegetation. Uh, along the creek bottoms, they're still going after the forbs and things. But they're still, um, still roots to dig. There are different berries out there. There are uh, different kind of buffalo berries that um, grow. I'm the one that got it. Uh, out along the creek bottoms and then the shrub fields out pretty far east. Uh, there are still choke cherries and things like that pretty far out there. Okay, that's wonderful. And then one more question I have about the. Some of the changes you may have seen out on the plains is, or that we might expect to see um, as bears continue to move back out in this historic habitat. Was there any difference in terms of timing of denning for bears on the plains versus timing of denning for bears in the mountains that, that you have? Didn't observed? notice any. Actually, the, one of the first ones we found, well, it's not, it was after several years, actually. Um, there was a bear out there that I thought had either pulled its collar off or had been killed. And um, I sent a technician out to pick up the collar or to find the carcass, whatever it was. And, and he went out and was just getting close to the area and the bear stuck its head up out of a hole. This was in, you know, late September, early October even. And the bear ended up staying in that den all winter and came out in the spring with cubs. So um, there was no difference in that case. And she was denned up fairly early, even by you know, our standards if, if she was in the mountains. And that was because she was pregnant and the bears that are pregnant go in the den first and come out last. And so when she came out um, in the middle or late April way, um, she had kids, but she was certainly in pretty early. That's okay. So at least at the data that you've collected to this point, not necessarily any noticeable di differences in terms of timing. No. between the two locations. We got a question here from um, Jack and Jack wants to know how many bears you estimate are out on the prairie. Good question, Jack. Um, I don't know. You know, it, it <laughs> changes <laughs> for me to just kind of guess how many are out there. Um, it depends on what area you're looking at on the whole reservation. And if you just call the prairie like from here east versus if you look at like from Highway 89 east or something. Um, but I don't know, uh, dozens and dozens anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And before we get to our next question here, just a reminder, folks, we're under 26 minutes now to go um, in the auction. It's, we've had a lot of bids coming in while Dan's been presenting information here on grizzly bears. Um, the uh, basket of yarn, uh, the uh, vacation getaway in Santa Fe and on the Oregon coast, the drop camp with, uh, um, uh, excuse me, with Frank Vitale, all have been very hot during this time. So make sure you're checking on your bids and getting those in here as we're in our closing minutes um, of the, the auction. And um, I'd like to now uh, ask a question that Merritt submitted, Dan, and Merritt wants to know on average how long bears live and whether or not um, if there's any difference in their lifespan if bears eat trash versus bears that don't eat trash? Good questions, Merritt. Um, you know, this past spring, 
I, I still go out in the spring a couple of times. Uh, well, I have in the last few years to help the Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife guys to train them and, and so on. So this past spring, we uh, went out, they called me and I went out and helped when we drugged a grizzly bear. And she was one that I had tagged in, I think, 1999 or something and knew how old she was then. And now she's 35 years old. And she was coming into heat. There were a couple of two-year-olds running around, which meant she had had cubs a couple of years ago. And it looked like she was probably going to be mating this spring. And so I'm looking forward to seeing if she comes out of her den with cubs this spring. But from my experience, that's one of the oldest bears that I know of that um, that I have worked on. Um, and I can almost guarantee you she has probably never been around garbage very much. The bears that are getting into garbage, I think, have a much shorter life expectancy because they're more apt to get into trouble of some kind or another. Uh, they're more apt to go into somebody's garage or, or something like that and, and get into trouble and either get shot by locals or uh, have to be the target of a management action where we um, sometimes we end up having to destroy bears that are too food conditioned or, or habituated to people. Um, that's, that's a good question. And I, you know, bottom line is the habitats out there, but I think that's not the limiting factor on what bears, on the bear population, it, it's people that's the limiting factor on the bear population. That's what ends up killing more bears than, than uh, lack of food or something. So the, the main issue there, if I'm hearing right, isn't a nutritional difference between trash and non-trash, although perhaps there's something there, but it's mostly um, to get to Merritt's question, the bears that get into the trash, as you said, a fed bear is a dead bear, it tends to lead to conflicts and then they're removed by right. managers um, for that reason. Right. Um, yeah, before we get to the next question, just want to give an update on one of the, the great fall gathering traditions, the annual pie contest between Lou Bruno and Pat Hagen for top huckleberry pie. Of course, Pat um, does a fresh huckleberry pie um, and Lou does a baked one. Um, both collect their huckleberries locally. It's a, a fabulous tradition here. We're locked in a pretty tight race right now, but Pat Hagen is on pace to defend his crown from 2020. <laughs> um, currently leading with a bid of $500 to Lou just recently got a bid in here from Karen at 425 for Lou's pie. So. All of those who believe in Lou Bruno's uh, wonderful huckleberry pie, now's the time to get your bid in and help him get his crown back. Um, otherwise, Pat's on his way to becoming a two-time defending huckleberry pie champion. Um, let's stick with prairies for a moment here and, um, and our questions. And we have a question from Jeff and Tracy who want to know about prairie dens. Um, when bears select sites for prairie dens, how important um, is snow cover? Is that required for the den sites? as we tend to associate in the mountains or is that not required for those den sites? Yes. I, don't, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Most of the sites that I've seen are areas that uh, you would expect snow to drift there, but not all of them. And as you know, a lot of those sites out on the prairie, even if the snow has drifted, might not have snow on them uh, in February or, or March. So I think that, um, it's convenient, but I don't think that it's a necessity. Okay, so it's it's it might just be more of um, early site selection and that we're getting right now, but isn't seems to be the necessarily evidence that bears are selecting specifically for potential snow cover out there. Um, as you said, it had more to do with shrub cover potentially helping to maintain the the integrity of of the dens. Yeah, um, some of the some of the dens that I've seen are actually on. Um, slopes that face to the west, which are not really where you would expect snow to be um, drifting even. So uh, yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure what all they're using as selection criteria, but 
but I don't think it's necessarily that they're sure that it's going to fill up with snow. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and let's get to another question here. Uh, this happens to be from what our leading uh, pie maker, Pat Hagen. Um, and Pat wants to know, uh, Dan, how do you think climate change is going to be affecting bears in this region? And in particularly, how might it affect bear management moving into the future? Oh, good questions. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I know that a couple of years ago, you heard um, Doug Chadwick talk about grizzly bears in the in the Gobi Desert. Um, I, you know, historically they've been from Alaska down to Mexico, and from the west coast out onto the prairie. Um, they're very adaptable. Uh, individual bears can adapt to all sorts of different habitats and climates. I think that the potential is there for at least part of the population to adapt and do fine with climate change. I don't know the, the trick there will be integrating that adaption with people. Um, it, it's like I said, I don't think habitat or the particular climate is necessarily a limiting factor. I think it's how bears end up getting along with people and the conflicts that might arise there. Gotcha. So, and in part, I would imagine knowing what we know out of places like you mentioned, Doug Chadwick's talk in, 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 in the Gobi Desert, but also out of Yellowstone where bears have been documented. I think it's 242 different food species that they eat. Um, yeah having a, a very plastic diet in terms of very flexible right. kind of diet. Um, and we noticed, I know one of the big concerns for Yellowstone grizzlies, of course, is climate change affecting things like white bark pine, which has forced grizzly bears at to lower elevations during, particularly during hunting season, which has led to increased conflicts. Have we seen anything similar in terms of kind of those ripple effects in this part of the, the ecosystem where climate change has affected a food source or um, otherwise had an indirect effect that's led to greater bear mortalities? Well, I, I think there's, um, you know, there used to be more white bark pine here as well, but um, I have not documented uh, necessarily a, a change in food source due to climate, but it's like I said, um, when I first started working here, half of the bears that we had radio collared would go up in the park and eat army cutworm moths. Mm -hmm. And recently, the bears that I've been collaring haven't been doing that. Other bears have been, but bears that I've collared in the same area that I did in 1988 have not been going up and eating army cutworm moths. So okay. there's a difference there. I don't think it's necessarily caused by climate change, but... Um, maybe a behavioral one, maybe um, what mom teaches them to do, but I, I don't know for sure why that is. You would think that the mothers would, you know, just keep teaching the kids, let's go up in the first part of July yeah, and yeah. eat moths, but, um, but they're not doing that anyway. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's interesting. It's interesting to see that change. And before we get on to the next question here, Dan, just want to send out a couple of thank yous to uh, folks who have donated during this presentation and this week to help uh, support the uh, hiring of the community outreach and engagement coordinator here at Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance. Um, thank you to Linda and Elaine, to Sarah, um, to Dave, and to uh, many others. There's still it's a great time to get in and have your donation go to support this new position that'll help uh, better build support and community um, engagement around protection of not just the, the lands of the badger two medicine, but species like grizzly bears, where it's such core uh, and critical habitat. Also, we're getting a lot of bids coming in right now on a number of the uh, vacation getaways in Santa Fe and the Oregon coast running neck and neck um, for in popularity, as well as seeing some bids come in on the wonderful Glacier Sun Tours uh, trip. It's, I think, a really important trip for probably all of us to take at some point in time and really hear a Blackfeet interpretive tour of uh, Glacier Park, which is of course part of the Blackfeet traditional homelands. 
so make sure you get in on that and some of the fabulous artwork. I just see a bid coming in on the Butte mining painting. Um, we also, of course, have a lot of bids coming in on Ernest Marceau's fabulous artwork that he gave for um, the Glacier Two Medicine's fall gathering poster. So get in there. We're down to about 10 minutes, 15 minutes remaining. And with that, let's go ahead and ask a question from Diva here who wants to know about um, grizzly bears that were seen and maybe the singular bear in the snowy mountains recently. Do you have any knowledge on where that bear came from and how it may have gotten to the snowy mountains? Did that come out of the NCDE population or greater Yellowstone or what insight might be able to share with us about that bear? I don't know anything about it. Okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's an easy answer there. Um, well, let, let's, let's jump down here to a, a question coming in from Kelly. I, I, I really like this question. Uh, it's actually, it's two, it's two questions. I'm gonna ask you the second one first. So I think it'll be a quicker answer. In your opinion, whose hawks are more likely to have been collected legally, loos or pats? I would guess pats probably would be more likely to be collected legally just because he's a park uh, employee. Okay, How's there we that? go. We, we have it. Uh, you heard it here from the authority on Huckleberry Collection, Dan Carney. So if that... Uh, um, influences your decision on who's high to bid for. Um, <laughs> Pat, the likely um, law follower, or Lou, the likely scoff law when it comes to Huckleberry Collection. You can get your bids in now <laughs> <laughs> on that one. Um, yeah, I just saw some uh, uh, another donation coming in to Glacier Two Medicine Alliance to help support the uh, outreach and community engagement coordinator. Thank you for that. Um, so Dan, here's question, Kelly's serious question. What advice would Dan Carney of 2021 tell Dan Carney of 1987 when it comes to your work around grizzly bears? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question, but I, um, you know what, well, if I knew then uh, what I know now, I would um, certainly have an in on the methods we do with, uh, you know, things like, like I showed about the different garbage collection and, and things like that. So I would be able to skip a lot of experimenting and um, problems that we've uh, discovered over the years. But as far as telling, you know, telling me, whispering in my ear what I should or shouldn't do, I, um, I've had a pretty darn good career and I, I probably wouldn't change a whole lot. It's, um, it's been very rewarding. And, and like I said at the end there, I, um, I, I feel very privileged to have been able to work with the animals that I've had the opportunity to work with. That's awesome. I, you know, as a, as a non-biologist, I'm also often uh, a little jealous of my of biologists like yourself or Val Asher. We got to see working with wolves, or even my uh, sister who works with birds, and the time you get to spend in the field, getting to just really know and understand these species, and what you must get to see and experience um, being out there. Uh, I want to before I ask my next question, which follows up on the advice you may or may not have given your younger self. I um, want to just thank Joel and Dan for your, your donations here as part of uh, uh, this fundraiser to help support the hiring of that new position. And also excited to see um, a bid just come in, the, the vacation getaway to Santa Fe, putting that up over $2,000. So very excited. I hear Santa Fe is a fabulous place to spend some time. So make sure you get in and get the opportunity to see that really wonderful uh, historic casita firsthand. And of course, as someone who grew up in Oregon, I have a fondness both for the Olympic Peninsula where we have a lovely VRBO close to salmon fishing and bike riding as well as the Oregon coast, um, both beautiful locations. So Dan, sticking with some of the work you did um, around garbage, um, how effective did you see those coexistence strategies, both with garbage, with landowners and, and ranchers and other people in terms of building tolerance for, for grizzly bears? Some people are great to work with and, and others, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, I think the opportunity is there and the potential is there to um, 
to do the right thing, you know, for most people and, and things will work out fine. There's uh, always, as you know, more and more people moving into rural areas and into areas where there are grizzly bears. And that is the big challenge in uh, my mind is teaching the new folks um, the things that the, that the people that have lived there for a long time um, know. There's always new houses and, and uh, people that wanna have gardens and chickens and uh, you know the whole thing, have three dogs and feed them on the porch and uh, hummingbird feeders on the deck and, and that sort of thing that um, it's just a never ending uh, job of educating those people and doing things so that they realize how important it is to keep those sorts of uh, attractants out of bear's reach. And a lot of them don't get it until they end up um, causing bears to die. And it just depends on the individual then how much that affects their behavior. So, um, I guess bottom line is it, it all depends on the people. Some people would rather have their chickens and don't care about grizzly bears as much as, as others. And, um, you know, I'm not talking about anybody specific or anything like that, but um, it's, it's just, um, it's all an individual thing, how successful the education and work that uh, people that are trying to prevent conflicts uh, how successful they can be at it. Yeah, that's, and it just really seems like it's, that's, it's, as you said, it's gonna be a continuous process, both as bears expand their range and as people continue to move into bear country and it'll be critical for the long-term um, persistence of grizzly bears, particularly because we know that our protected areas and our core habitat is not large enough for grizzly bears to persist on the landscape. I'm gonna ask just one more question here, Dan, to kind of wrap, um, things up and then we're going to do a little bit of a live countdown here on the final auction items but great want to also thank donna for a lovely donation uh towards supporting that um hiring of the new community outreach and engagement coordinator seen lots of uh bids coming in here as dan was talking uh, including on that lewis and clark history tour and on two nights at the mountain pine and of course earlier that was very active on this wonderful basket of yarn so make sure you get out there and 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 check out these bids before uh you have about seven minutes to get your final bids in. So the last question I think we have here for you tonight, Dan, uh, comes from Jesse. And um, Jesse asks, uh, it, or heard that it looked like a lot of grizzly bills were being killed in the 80s compared to the 90s and 2000s. Um, is, is it, first, was that accurate? Has there been a change in kind of management removal of grizzly bears or grizzly bears lost to, to humans? Um, and what has been the, the driving some of those changes, whatever that, that trend actually might be. So kind of a question of clarification on the trend in, in grizzly bear, human caused grizzly bear mortality um, in, in this region. And well, what those um, as far as the management end of stuff, I can only talk about what happened in the late eighties from like when I got here on, I think before that it's, it's like I said, other studies showed that bears that came onto the reservation that were radio collared just disappeared. I think then in the early 80s and then in quite possibly even through the 80s, there was probably more illegal mortality. But I guess what I hope is us stepping in and doing more management than we did, uh, than had been going on before that. We showed ranchers and, and farmers and residents that we could take care of some of those problems, some of them without killing bears. So I, I think uh, I have to believe that some of those mortalities uh, decreased because of the work that we were doing. And um, that's why the population uh, increased some. I, I think that later on, when I first started, we didn't kill many bears at all as far as for management reasons. Um, but later on, by the oh, 2010 and so on, we were sometimes kill bears that were killing livestock or 
or so on. As the population increased, the Fish and Wildlife Service got more lenient on what bears should be killed. There was always a, um, a ceiling on that, that we wouldn't go above. But um, because there were more bears, I think, um, there were a few more being killed for management reasons. But the more, you know, there was also better management going on and proportionally to what was in the population, I don't think as many bears uh, by then. Now, it's a different story. Um, in the last few years, in some places like the Flathead Valley, and I don't know where along here, uh, I think it's different. And there are, there's less, um, less patience with the bears. And I, I think some more bears are being killed. Uh, okay. New regulations with the state legislature and things like that, uh, as far as what bears you can even relocate. Okay. Uh, they're getting their two cents worth of, yeah. of their ideas Lovely. involved in the biology of it and so on. So okay. thank everyone for being part of this fabulous week. It's really been an amazing time of connection even as we've had to go virtually once again to, to the uh, raging pandemic um, that is washing across the state of Montana right now. So uh, thank you for those who um, have joined us virtually from not only here in Montana, but around the country, Idaho and Iowa and Indiana and Florida and California, um, just some of the states where we've had people join us from, um, Wisconsin and Oregon, and uh, Washington. It's just really been lovely to share this time with you. Um, thank you to everyone who has uh, made a donation, who has bid, uh, whether you've won or lost. Uh, we just appreciate you being part of this important fundraiser for Glacier Two Medicine Alliance. Um, I also want to give a shout out again to all of our guests who were part of making this just an amazing week. To Dr. Christina Eisenberg um, and to uh, Governor Steve Bullock and Dan Carney for providing such insightful um, presentations on um, really important issues from restoring ecological relationships in the crown to citizen advocacy for protecting public lands and wildlife uh, to grizzly bear uh, biology and um, conflict management. Uh, thank you too to Willow Kipp and Daniel Glick for joining us for our movie night and to Joey Running Crane for the live music. It was, uh, if you guys haven't heard that, please check him out on our YouTube channel and follow him on Spotify. It's really been fantastic um, to get to know Joey's music through the course of this. And of course, I gotta give a huge shout out here to Ashley Sherburn, who's been our event planner, who's done so much work behind the scenes uh, to both plan the fall gathering and help make for a, a seamless pivot uh, to this online virtual event. And to Natasha Barta, our administrative assistant who just uh, rolls with everything that we need to have happen uh, who helped uh, turn Ernest Marceau's fabulous artwork into the fall gathering poster and uh, do a lot of our social media outreach. And a huge thank you to our volunteer um, committees, our board in particular, Beth Hagen and Gina Rink and Bill Carden, who worked tirelessly to put this fabulous auction together, um, as well as to uh, J John Schmid and Dylan DeRosier for helping to lead the hikes. Um, both on Sunday and then Dylan and I with the Browning High School students on, on Tuesday during this fall gathering week. Um, and there's been many others um, who've helped put in some time and effort uh, into this fall gathering. We're very, very grateful for that. And again, thank you to all of our donors, to the businesses, to Glacier Sun Tours and Dropstone Outfitting, Bear Creek Ranch, um, Lone Elk uh, Lodge, to Kayla Creative, um, to Glacier Trading Company, to Triple Divide Photography, um, to, uh, we just thank all of you for being part of this, to Diva and Elaine and to Ashley and um, to Glacier Guides and to Fran Coover and Tracy Vivar and many others who donated items uh, for our auction. Lauren Pinsky with some of the wood carvings to the JL Clark Gallery and Dana Turvey. Um, this really is a community effort and that is never clearer than during the fall gathering. Um, when we come together as Glacier Two Medicine Alliance to celebrate these incredible wildlands um, and both their ecological and cultural importance. So thank you for being part of the critical work that we're doing at Glacier Two Medicine Alliance um, to protect uh, the crown of the continent ecosystem, to help protect and support Blackfeet-led efforts to protect their sacred lands uh, and to restore cultural connections 
to help ensure that our public lands are places where people of all backgrounds can uh, enjoy quiet backcountry recreation and be a place importantly where wildlife, grizzly bears and bison and wolves and cutthroat trout um, and Clark's nutcrackers and white bark pine can continue to thrive for generations to come. So we're just very grateful to all of you who've been a part of this work and who will continue to be a part of this work. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you more about it um, as we go uh, this fall. Um, and you're interested in getting more involved with Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance, please reach out. Um, we're gonna have opportunities, particularly this winter for some citizen science monitoring around illegal snowmobile trespass. Um, we'll also have some opportunities uh, moving into next spring for citizen science monitoring. Uh, we're hoping to partner with uh, some research in the park that may be expanding south into the forest around white bark pine and Clark's nutcrackers and surveys for harlequin ducks, um, as well as uh, working for some uh, citizen science along the Highway 2 corridor where we're hoping to jumpstart an effort to help ensure that grizzly bears and other wildlife can move safely across that corridor. So there'll be lots of ways to get involved in that way. We're also always looking for people with uh, special skill sets who wanna help with things like um, information technology or uh, mailings or um, outreach to community members when it comes time for submitting comments on different action items uh, that we have. So if these are things that interest you um, from, from office work to phone calls to citizen science work to uh, expertise in, in, in biological sciences and policy, we wanna help you be engaged and, and your voice be heard um, in these efforts. So please reach out to us and let us know uh, if that's of interest to you or keep your eyes on your email inbox for newsletters about these opportunities as they um, come forward. So again, thank you tonight as we wrap up here. Um, there's still time to get in on this fabulous opportunity to make a donation in support of our community outreach and education coordinator. This person will be uh, hired by the end of the year through a WEIS fellowship that provides 80% of support over the next two years for this position. And we raise the other 20% through donations such as yours tonight. And this will really help us better um, engage uh, our, the local community and citizens around Montana um, in efforts both to protect and steward the Badger 2 medicine region so that it remains this incredibly wild land that it is. One of the things we learned through the recent efforts to uh, advance permanent protection was just the need for better grassroots organizing and more capacity on the ground. And this position will really help uh, fill that critical gap and help move that long-term vision of permanent protection closer uh, to reality. So thank you to everyone who has donated over the course of this week um, to that cause and who will continue to donate tonight uh, to that cause. Um, also, one last thing, another announcement I want to share too, as I mentioned earlier this week, we're going to be doing a, a survey here of all of our um, supporters and members to learn more about your interests in our work and your interest in conservation, as well as how we, the Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance, can better communicate with you and help you feel um, engaged and connected with our work. It'll only take about five to seven minutes. It'll come into your email inbox sometime in the next two weeks. Please do fill that out. That information is really important to us. This is the first time we have conducted anything like this. And this will be really helpful for us shaping um, our work over the next few years um, and doing so in a way that really helps um, bring the voices of the community together um, in a way that's effective for conservation, because that's one of our core commitments here at Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance, is that we are a grassroots organization and we really depend on the power of the community and the power of people like yourself. And we wanna help um, engage and connect and bring your voices forward to our leaders and to the managers to ensure that these wildlands remain um, in just these wonderful undeveloped state that they are today. And that discrete threats like oil and gas and motorized trespass um, are addressed and that they, our agencies have the capacity to do the work that they need to do, and that relationships between the tribe and the Forest Service and the Park Service are strengthened to make for better um, management of shared resources and across boundaries. So we want to make sure you're involved in all of that work, and um, this survey will help us make sure that we do so in a good way. So you can watch that for that in your inbox. Um, again, I'm going to sign off here in just a minute. Uh, thank you again to all of our donors. Thank you to all of our supporters who've made um, contributions this week in various ways. And thank you to the people who gave of their time and their knowledge and their passion uh, through this fall gathering. It has been an amazing week, an amazing eight days here at Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance. And I'm so proud to be part of this organization and so grateful for all of you. Um, thank you for 
the work you do. Thank you for spreading the good news and the good words about conservation and helping us um, just make a better future for, for people and wildlife here in the Crown. And um, with that, uh, feel free to continue to get your donations in, uh, check out um, your winning bids in the checkout system. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and um, let us know too how uh, best we can get those auction items. So whether you want them shipped or we can better yet save some uh, money and, and, and hand them off to you. So congratulations auction winners. Congratulations, Pat Hagen on winning this year's uh, Huckleberry Pie um, crown once again. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend. And please, as Bill Beck said, if you're in the area, now is a great time to get into the Badger 2 medicine and just enjoy that landscape. Um, and so we wish you a good night and we look forward to seeing you next year in person for the 13th annual fall gathering uh, here in East Glacier over the solstice, um, excuse me, the equinox uh, weekend. So with that, good night, everybody. And uh, thanks again, and we'll see you real soon.